why did she asks why did Pius X say that women shouldn't sing in church? Right. Correct. I don't, but I'm just saying that there was a reason why? that yeah. we didn't. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, obviously, a lot of women do sing in church, but it's much better when it's the men that sing. You're lucky if you have in your chapel men that sing, and that sing well enough for the ladies not to have to sing. That's right. Um, because... i got to help you. All yours. Thanks. Um, because... The argument of Pius X is that singing in church is a liturgical function that's strictly correct. Uh, and a liturgical, liturgical function should be taken by men. So you've got two statements there. But why should liturgical function? What is a liturgical function? A liturgical function is, is some solemn function in church, connected around the Mass. And the, the, the full liturgy is the Mass. Benediction is what you might call the semi-liturgy. But um, it should be men. St. Paul says, and it's the word of God. Don't drink this. Sure. Thank you very much. St. Paul says, I do not suffer women to teach in public. As St. Thomas Aquinas gives three reasons. All of this is horror for the modern mind in which men and women are exactly equal and there's no difference and therefore women should be taking all the functions that men do, including the priesthood. St. Thomas Aquinas gives three reasons. The first reason is that teaching is the function of a superior. And women are not to be superiors. I'm going to hide behind the podium. <laughs> Second reason is sheer common sense. You put up a woman in public and she's going to arouse not necessarily the right kind of attention nor the right kind of um, from the men. Because the woman is visually, women and men are different, visually the woman attracts the man rather more than the man attracts the woman. And therefore for a woman to stand up in public and, and present herself in public in front of a crowd of men and women you're going to get a number of men paying no attention you may remember that wicked congressman I think it was Adam Clayton Powell who was once asked a nasty question by a woman journalist he said honey you so purdy I can't hear you <laughs> you do not want in the school women teaching adolescent boys. It's common sense. It's old fashioned common sense. But of course, our wonderful modern age knows better. No, it doesn't. It knows much worse. Our modern age is stupid spelled S-T-O-O-B-I-D because people are so stupid today they can't even spell. <laughs> Women are not to be placed in positions of superiority. What does our modern world do? Our modern world, all of this concerns family, believe me. I wasn't going to talk about this, but it's a big question. <clears throat> Women are not to be placed in positions of superiority. What does the modern world do? The modern world has everything being run by women, correct? Yes. And 
it's a great mistake. It's a, it's 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 unnatural. It it's because the men are not men. If the men were men, they would say, "Look, honey, just move aside. This is not your business." Out it, out, out. But the men today have got nothing in them. Now I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment. Second reason of St. Thomas, the women are going to arouse the wrong kind of attention in front of, by, in front of the men. I, I say, people know I say, and many people don't like me for saying it, if a lawyeress goes into court and pays attention to her parents before she goes into court, she's not going to be properly a lawyer. If she doesn't go pay attention to herself before she goes into court, she's not going to be properly a woman. She can't win. There are certain functions that women just should not occupy. They should not be pilots. You may remember the story of that cute little lady pilotess who was put in charge of an F-16 or something like that to land on an aircraft carrier and she finished at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean with a billion dollar machine and her life. And President Clinton, if you like, went out there to attend the funeral in order to say this was a pilotess and we all honor pilotesses because women should be pilotesses, because women are equal, because everybody is equal and there's no difference between men or women. Women can pilot an F-16 just as well as a man. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Because they don't have the qualities. Because men and women are different. And a woman has to make herself into a man in order to, uh, to for instance, uh, uh, pilot uh, a dangerous aeroplane. A difficult and dangerous aeroplane. I'll bet you none of the airlines, none of the airlines, announce over the loudspeaker at the beginning of a flight that, miss, that the, no, the first pilot is Mary Jones and the second pilot is Elizabeth Dill. Because if any, many passengers, if they heard that there were two women in the cockpit, they'd get straight off the plane. I would. <laughs> <laughs> Because they're very good at looking sweet and nice, and they go into the cockpit, and they show off in front of all the men, and they bully the stewardesses, and they bully the stewards, because now they've got authority. Authority does not fit the woman. With exceptions that you don't want to emphasize because you want to establish the rule. Women should not be in authority. Anybody, anybody want to walk out? <laughs> Just a moment. Let's have the third reason of St. Thomas Aquinas. We're talking about the greatest of the church doctors. And it's no use saying, we of the 21st century know better. We are different. Human nature has changed since the backwards Middle Ages. I'm sorry, that doesn't fly. This dog won't hunt. It doesn't fly because human nature does not change. The human nature of women is the same as it was in the Middle Ages. The human nature of men is the same as it was in the Middle Ages. What has changed is that the men today are in general dish rags. And therefore there's a vacuum of authority, a vacuum of leadership, which the women naturally, well, not natural, which the women unnaturally try to fill. Nature abhors a vacuum. There's a vacuum is left today by the men, and the women go in. The best of women try to get into the. Well, I won't say the best of women. The best of women will supply for that lack of authority while pretending, doing their best to pretend that they're not taking that authority. And that's not an easy thing necessarily to do, but that's much the wisest thing for a good woman to do. And yet you can watch good women, you can sometimes watch doing exactly that. 
guiding from behind, leaving the man up in front to be the figurehead. He's not much good at it, okay, she will, but she will still backseat drive or backseat guide. She will, she will do everything to avoid giving the impression that she is driving. She will guide. It befits a woman to guide. It does not befit a woman to drive. And the third reason St. Thomas Aquinas gives, and we're not talking about medieval nonsense, we're talking about permanent common sense. What is common sense? It's rare today. It's being washed out today. Modern man is doing his best to watch out common sense. Why? Because common sense belongs to human nature, and human nature comes from God. Modern man is making war on God, modern man is making war on nature, and modern man is therefore making war on common sense. Common sense is the grip on reality that God, in, with, that God with which God equips, kits out human nature. But the modern world knows so much better, doesn't it? Well, look what a mess modern man has now got into. We're on the brink of the most dreadful Third World War. It's not far off, I don't think. It's going to be horrible, and it's going to hit the United States. The World War I and World War II did not directly hit the United States. It hit a bunch of Americans who gave their lives all over the world, but it didn't actually land on America's shores. Well, this one next, in the next war will. Atom bombs will be flying around, and they'll hit, undoubtedly, a lot of American cities for the very simple reason that there's been a lot of sin in American cities, in other cities all over the world as well, it's not going to only hit the United States, but it's going to hit this time the United States as well. Be prepared. Third reason. Most women are not rational, says St. Thomas Aquinas. He is not talking medieval nonsense. Let me phrase that a little better. I'd like to use exactly the words he uses, I haven't got exactly the words he says, but that's what he means. Women, in most cases, ut in pluribus, I remember that, ut in pluribus, in most cases, women uh, do not, how, can, how does he say it? To, to say that they're not rational is to putting it, is putting it a bit too strong, but you, today you've got to, it's a, a subject, of, you, you, you've got to walk on, on tiptoes around this subject, but what it means is that reason is not the privilege of men. Let's put it like uh, not the privilege of women. Let's put it like that. Reason is not the privilege of women. What is the privilege of women is feeling. Feeling and intuition. Emotions of the heart. Woman is a creature of the heart. Man is a creature of the head. To lead, guide, teach, stand up in public, and eventually to sing, Although that's not exactly teaching, but it's still appearing. It's still women making themselves heard. Whenever any woman does anything in public, especially something prominent, all the other women present are immediately going to be anybody jealous. Correct? Do you want in church to make people jealous? This woman has a fine voice and she stands up and she sings the Ave Maria. Ave Maria. <laughs> every woman in the congregation, every woman in the church is going to be jealous because this woman is getting up in public and with her voice she is making herself present and felt and prominent. The other women are all going to be jealous. Men are not nearly so jealous of other men as women are of other women. Why? Interesting question. Because the woman is made for the nest. And the nest wants only one mother. And therefore, the woman in the nest chases out all other women. For the sake of the nest. And she's right. So... Women are naturally jealous of one another, and therefore a woman singing in church is going to make the other women jealous, which is why it's best if the men sing. It's best. 
If the men of such dish ranks, if they're such wimps that they say singing is wimpish, that they refuse to sing because they say it's not American football and only American football is fit for men, and all they want to do all weekend is flop down in a soft chair and watch American football. If those are your men, you can't be surprised if you have women singing in church. But women singing in church is not the ideal. The ideal is that all the singing, Gregorian or polyphony, should be done by men. If you say to me, well, there's some polyphony, which of course has sopranos and altos, and in the, in the old days that used to do on castra, by castrati, we don't have any castrati any longer. Well, I agree. But then it's going to be a mixed choir, yes. But a woman who understands her role might not want to sing. And if I was the pastor, I would certainly not push any woman to sing in the choir, even in a mixed choir. She might prefer, she might prefer to. I wouldn't, if, if, if that's the only singing that we have, because polyphony is more popular, perhaps more easy than Gregorian. But in any case, uh, they, uh, there, those are the three reasons. One, two, three. Um, and why, why St. Thomas says that preaching is, or teaching in public is not for women. An objection is made. What about a woman and her child? Teaching in the home, yes. A thousand times yes. Teaching in the home is motherly, is feminine. It's what God made mothers for, to teach the children and especially the girls, the girls all the way through. A girl's best university is her mother's kitchen. Don't let women go to these wretched universities of today in general and don't even let your boys go. Because these universities of today will make mincemeat of your children's faith and even their common sense. Because these universities will teach against common sense. Because the modern world knows better. And we in our modern universities, we're teaching the modern values. And your children are going to need the modern values. Well, if you want to go with the, if you want to go with the flow, yes, your children will need all the modern garbage. But if you don't want to go with the flow and drop into hell, then you're going to need to swim against the flow. And you're going to need to, you're going to, need to not send your children. You, the, the poor parents that go into debt because of the huge debt in order to pay their children's way through college, it's, it's the worst investment there could be. And then, otherwise, if the parents don't pay for it, the, the, the boys and the girls go into debt. And you may know that there are adults of 40 years, 50 years old, who still have a, a student debt hanging around their neck like an albatross. It doesn't make sense in any shape, size, or form. These modern universities are places of intellectual, moral, and spiritual corruption. Do you want your child to be corrupted? Then send them to university. Ah, but they need a university degree to, 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 to get this or that job. You know, I was listening the other night to somebody, to a man who works in NASA. He, uh, no, NS, NSA, not NASA. NSA. National Security Administration. Okay. And he said he didn't like the DOD, the Department of Defense, because there's a kind of rivalry. Yeah, that's it. So he's proud of NSA, and he's good. I mean, by, he, he's good. And he was saying, we had a, a, a lad in the, uh, there, a 15-year-old lad, and um, this man was on the one hand recognizing that modern universities are useless. On the other hand, he was saying, you must have your degree because I won't employ you in NSA if you don't have a college degree. One moment. No, was here's an intelligent man without the good sense to go against the flow. He's saying, You're, these university degrees are useless, but unless you have one, I won't employ you. Does that make sense? He says, what's his justification? His justification is that a university degree is at least some kind of measure. And we need some kind of measure of what the young man can do, or the young woman. N crazy. Crazy. If I was an employer, well, I mean, that's not the case, but if I was an employer, and I have one young man who 
who seems to have some, and then another young man who seems to have some common sense and some decency, but he has got a college degree, I'd be strongly inclined to employ the one that has not got the college degree, because he will have been exposed to much less nonsense than the other. The other, the, the, the youngsters come out of these universities full of pride. The world owes me a living. I am now a graduate. I'm somebody. And the world owes me a living. I, I, and they expect high salaries right from the word go. They've got all kinds of expectations, all kinds of demands. But do they know how to do an honest day's work for an honest day's pay? If a young man came, comes to me, I say, don't go to university. Where unless, unless he's got one, a, 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 an intelligence for books, unless he's, he's really a bookman, and two, he's got enough character not to just go with the university flow and throw frisbees for four years and come out of the university with a circular piece of paper, the shape of a frisbee, with two black ears on top. And that's his uh, degree. That, that's the certificate of his degree. No thanks. Thanks, but no thanks. It is time that Catholics use their common sense and stop sending their children to these mincemeat factories, which will make mincemeat of their common sense, in which the boys and girls freely mix and mix in the dormitories. And it's thoroughly normal that they will have one or two or three or four or five affairs, and they will, if they don't lose their honor, especially the girls, they will, they're sure to lose their, they're sure to soil their heart. A girl will soil her heart by going through several love affairs. Even if she doesn't give herself away, she will soil her heart. Her, sh her heart will become shop soiled by a series of affairs. It's not a place to send a girl. No way, no way, no way. Then where else should they go? Well, let them, let them learn everything there is to learn in their mother's kitchen and, and at home about homekeeping and homemaking. The greatest thing a girl will have to do is to make a home, and that's creative, to build a nest, and to keep the other women out of her nest, so that she will look after her husband, and she will keep her husband and hold her husband. That's her business. And she will look after her children. Oh, but I want to be creative. I want to, be a, I want to have a creative job. Ooh. I want to be respected by people. Ooh. It's true. <laughs> It's true that today a woman will not be respected unless she's out in the marketplace soiling her heart, prinking herself up in order to attract the men. But of course, I'm not going to commit adultery. Oh, no, you aren't, but you're nevertheless going to make, your, make the best possible use you can of what you still have of good looks. Isn't that contradictory? Modern life is, is absolutely screwed up from top to bottom. And so, um, women should best not sing in church, best, unless there's a, a real vacuum which the men are too many dish rags to fill. The problem, all right, now let's back up. The main problem of women today is the men folk. Women naturally follow their men that's what they're natured to do by God. And they're natured to adapt themselves and wrap themselves around their men. Russian proverb, which some of you may have seen in the some comments. As the tomato steak is to the tomato plant, so the man is to the woman. The, the plant is made to wrap itself around the steak and to climb the steak. And the plant has all the tenderness, it has the color and it bears the fruit. The stake has got one thing to do, to stand straight, pointing at heaven, and to not bend with the wind and not to go with the flow, to stand straight and stand firm, so that a woman can wrap herself around him and climb. If the men are unmanned, then what you're going to have is two tomato plants wrapping themselves around one another, and where the two tomato plants wrapping themselves around one another finish up, they both finish in the mud. St. Paul says, Word of God, 
and this is God's idea, as Christ is the head of the man, so the man is the head of the woman. And there you have the key. The men are meant to be, are meant to ha have a superior and a head above them, and that it is God, in other words, <laughs> the second person of the Holy Trinity, our Lord Jesus Christ. Ever since the incarnation, our Lord Jesus Christ. The man is the is meant to lift the whole family towards God because he himself is pointing towards God. And then the family climbs up around him and he lifts them. But if he's not pointing towards God, if he's not aiming to get to heaven, if he does not adore our Lord Jesus Christ as the second person of the Holy Trinity, then, then he's not going to point at heaven and he's not going to raise the family up. A woman, of course, a good wife, is an enormous support to a man. An enormous support, a priceless support. Read, read in Proverbs th uh, 31, Proverbs chapter 31, the uh, Holy Scriptures portrait of the good woman, the good wife. And she keeps her house, and she looks after her household, and she watches over it, and she makes sure that it works. And her husband is proud of her, and her children are proud of her, and her children love her, the good woman. The home is the place of the woman. But the modern world thinks the woman might just as well be out in the marketplace as the man. And many of you know, many of you have heard, if you don't know, what you will hear from many a university student today. The girls come out, are now at the stage of coming after the boys more than the boys come after the girls. That the boys go after the girls is normal. I mean, if they're Catholics, they're, it's, it's, it's going to be an, an honorable. It's, it's not going to be just chasing any, any girl. It's going to be, well, let's stop for a moment. What is honorable on the part of young men? What is, it, it's not honorable to go after a girl unless you're looking for someone to marry. Unless you have in mind that perhaps this girl will be one to marry. The rest is not honorable. How many boys at today's universities go after only girls that they're thinking of marrying? I, you could, I, I should get, at a guess, you could count them almost on the fingers of one hand today. They have so unlearned the decency and the honor of yesterday's behavior. And these are, these are not even supernatural things that one is saying. The, the Catholic Church lends enormous strength and force to what is naturally good, but it's naturally good. It, it's, it, it's, it, even nature, even according to nature, good nature, not as un undermined by uh, original sin, good nature, one man, one woman. And that is so much the case. One man, one woman is so much the case that the divorce courts have the walls spattered with blood and bones as man in the divorce courts tears apart what God put, what God put, man puts asunder what God joined. Scriptures, our Lord says, let man not pull asunder what uh, God put together. But the divorce courts do exactly that. And it's so natural for one, for one woman and one man to, once they're married, to, to hold together until death be apart, that when they allow themselves to be torn apart or when they want to tear apart, it causes all kinds of hardship and hurt. Not only, of, let, let alone to the children, to those, the, to the parties divorcing themselves. So, what is, and that's, that's true, it's in, it, it's in human nature that it should be only one man, one woman. Script, uh, and of course, uh, uh, that's what our Lord teaches, uh, uh, back fortifies, reinforces as well. The, the uh, why are, why does modern life, then let's assume that, 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 uh, that feelings and intuition are the privilege of woman. That's the best way to say it. Oh, it's my privilege. Oh, I'll buy that. 
but you're inferior. Oh, I won't buy that. But you have a privilege to be superior in feeling. Oh, yes. That way you can sell it. So it's the privilege of man to be a creature of reason. It's the privilege of woman to be a, a creature of the heart. God designed the head and the heart to complement one another and to make a team. Man without woman, says the, another Russian proverb, man without woman is like a man out in winter without a fur cap. The Russian winter is pretty severe. So when the Russian proverb says a man without a woman is like a man out in winter without a fur cap, the man is in trouble. And many a man without a wife is in trouble. In the, naturally, the two man and woman come together, obviously. R another Russian proverb. Man without a wife is like a garden without a hedge. The hedge protects the garden, wraps itself around the garden, shields the garden, keeps what's inside inside, what's outside outside. And that's, again, what you can observe of with a wise wife, you can watch her doing that. Keeping things away from her husband that should be kept away and holding her husband to things to which he should be held. So, man without woman is a zero. Okay? He's not much. Unless he's, let's suppose, unless he's got a special vocation, a celibate vocation, then we're in a different ballpark. Woman without man is even less, because woman, ever since Adam and Eve, the part of the curse of Eve for having seduced her husband and made her husband fall, Eve fell and made Adam fall. Adam just fell. He didn't make anybody else fall. He fell. But Eve fell and made fall. And therefore her punishment is more severe. And since she made Adam fall, then her punishment, it's in scripture, the word of God, your, you will be under the dominion of your husband. There will be a subjection. There was, prior to original sin, a natural order in which uh, man and woman, the man was nevertheless the head. Uh, any order means there's going to be a number one and a number two, and there's going to, always going to, in any order, there's always going to be a number one. Everything that God does is ordered. Therefore, all over the universe you find number one. The number one of flowers is the rose. The number one of animals is the lion. The number one, etc., etc., etc. Right, so, then, that, that's natural subjection. Even without supernature. There's a natural subjection of woman to man. Uh, that natural subjection is made unpleasant by original sin. It wasn't unpleasant prior to original sin. It becomes, it chafes, it hurts after original sin. She's under man in a way she doesn't want to be under man. Catholic grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, works against original sin and the consequences, and therefore in a household of grace, the man is the head, but it doesn't chafe or hurt for the woman to be underneath the head. For every practice, every modern woman, for every modern woman, it hurts for the work to be, a, the, the, the headship of men hurts. But it's a good deal of men's fault, a very great deal. However, let's have a look. So, woman is dependent on man. She's not even a circle, she's an incomplete circle. She is, as, a state, as you read in Genesis, going to be dependent upon her man. Dependent upon her man. He is not dependent in the same way. A man, a husband does depend upon his wife, but not in the same way or to the same degree as the wife depends upon the husband. But what happens when you put the two together? Husband and wife, we have zero and now suddenly we've got eight. We've jumped from zero to eight. And that's exactly how God designed it. And the, the, the wife is meant to be the one who turns a man from zero to eight. And a good wife will do that. That is her function. That's how God designed her. But she's always going to be under her husband. Look at, remember the miraculous medal. What do you see? A cross and then the M. The woman is underneath. 
But is the Blessed Mother of God in any way less dignified for being under her Divine Son? Of course not. Do you think her Son in any way looked down upon her or tr treated her as an inferior simply because she was a woman? Of course not. And that's the Catholic way. And so what is for sure is that in the terrible agony of the cross, it's very doubtful whether our Lord could, in his pure human nature, could have endured everything he was enduring without his mother being there to support him from underneath. She was at the foot of the cross. She was supporting him. And uh, it's a support that he absolutely needed. He was divine. He had a divine nature even on the cross. He pushed aside his divine nature in order to take the full weight of all of our sins upon his human nature. And he was crushed, the scripture, like a worm beneath a boot. He was crushed by all of the weight of all of the sins. Could he have borne it without his mother? Surely not. That's the importance and value of a woman who supports from underneath a man. From underneath, because he's the head. But it's her glory and it's her vocation. However, what do you think a woman feels like when the man is like this? Some droopy, silly wimp. <laughs> when men are not men, it's difficult for women to be women. And it's difficult for them to be wise. It's difficult for them to occupy the right place when they're not, when they've got a man who isn't a man. Why are men not men? Why, why does modern life, in a way, hit the men harder than it hits the women? To begin with, it hits the men harder than when it hits the women. But when it finally hits the women, then we've got a real disaster. When a man misbehaves, the roof blows off the house. But when a woman misbehaves, the very foundations shake. The woman is the foundation. The man is the head. The man is up above. But he, he's, he's less important to the whole to the whole situation than the woman is. He can blow off and, and she can hold on. But if she shakes, he's going to come tumbling. To begin with, in the modern world, the men blew off and the women held. You can see that in the literature of the 19th century. It's very interesting. And then finally in the 20th century, the women said, look, if the men are going to go on misbehaving and behaving, and, and if the men are going to go on refusing God, if the men refuse our Lord Jesus Christ, why should we women not refuse our men? If the men turn away from our Lord, why should the women go on obeying the men? As St. Paul says, as Christ is the head of the man, the man is the head of the woman. Or he says, the man is the head of the woman, as Christ is the head of the man, and God is the head of all. If the, woman, if, if the, if, if the men misbehave, the women... Uh, 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 it takes a time, it takes a while for the women to misbehave after the men start misbehaving. I'm talking of, of the history of the 19th century. The liberal revolution happened in 1789. Liberalism began working through the 19th century. And the, and, and the men began getting soppy and silly, turning away from God. The women held on for a while. But then finally they, uh, they said, if, um, if, the men are turning, if the men refuse to have any superior, why should we have these men as a superior? And that was the 20th century. That was the suffragette movement when the women started claiming the vote and so on and so on. It's a disaster. And then the 20th century really went crazy. The 19th century, you might say, was held together by the women, but the women finally grew fed up of having, holding things together when it should be the men holding things together. But the men are not men. Why not? That's another interesting question. And it's, I think this, this is the answer. Let's assume that reason, the head... <coughs> is above, let's say, feeling. <coughs> Not for nothing, God put the head on top, and then the heart comes underneath, and then there's the, uh, the rest of the human being. 
So reason is, is uh, the head directs the heart, so uh, man is meant to direct woman. Obviously, that's very schematic. Okay. Now, what does liberalism do? Liberalism attacks, firstly, the mind. Because liberalism, I was saying to you yesterday or the day before, uh, liberalism uh, dissolves the law of non-contradiction. Liberalism says, you can say that, 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 that the Catholic religion is true, you might also say the Protestant religion is true. So, but they, but they contradict one another. Well, yes, they do, but this is true for him, and this is true for her. Or this is true for, this is true for Jack, and that's true for Bill. So, you know, the contradiction doesn't matter. So you're, you're beginning to turn your head into mush. If the mush attacks the head, <coughs> if, if man is a creature of the reason, and the, the head collapses, the heart is still at least for a while in place. It will take a while before the heart also collapses. And hence you get uh, the a theme in 19th century literature and 19th century opera is redemption by love. I don't know if any of you know that. We're, we get, we, in the, 18th, at the end of the 18th century, we've, we've kicked out the, the Redeemer, our divine Lord, and there's a, a, a Redeemer is needed. And it's going to be since man has gone crazy, then it's going to be woman who will hold things together. You see that, for instance, in Wagner's Ring. You see it in Verdi's, this is opera, in Verdi's uh, Rigoletto. You see it, uh, I can't think of the other cases now, but there are, there, the, the, the idea in, in 19th century literature of the woman saving the situation because she is still She's holding together. She holds, when, when the head goes, it's not as important for the woman's head because she's not navigating by her head. She's navigating by her heart and by her womb. She is made for motherhood and she may lose, her head is not what counts. Some women are very intelligent, some women most certainly can think, but they, they won't direct their lives, nor will they be, nor will they be women by thinking. They will be women by something else. Those of you that are married, depending on how long you've been married, but most husbands, quite soon after they've been, after they've been married, realize that women don't run on quite the same gas, gasoline, as men do. Women are husbands discover after being married for a little while or for a longer while women are strange creatures <laughs> they are different they are different and it's because they're not running on a reason like the man is running on reason they don't run on reason they're running on a feeling so the reason liberalism may knock the reason off but it's not yet knocked the feeling off so women hold after, for a while after men have gone, after men have lost themselves, men, after men have gone crazy, the women still hold on for a while. But if the, if the men insist on going crazy and don't come back to sanity, then the woman is going to say, why should I hold things together? It's not my function. It's not my business. It's the, eight, the 19th century is unnatural in this sense, that, that the women were holding on when they shouldn't have been. But they did. Because a woman naturally wants to preserve the family. She's made for family. And when and the reason may go crazy, she still has these instincts of motherhood which are going to which are very difficult to destroy. The instincts of motherhood will still be there until, of course, the wretched twentieth century, when she is often going to have a hysterectomy in order to get rid of this messy business which has all to do with having children. And she rips the womb out of herself, and she rips the motherhood out and the femininity out of herself. Modern woman is an unspeakable disaster. Modern woman, not Catholic, modern woman. And it's the men's fault. Because the men should be leading. The men should be leading by directing uh, the, 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 the whole family towards, by directing themselves, first themselves towards God, and then the, the whole family following towards God. 
And when they don't do that, then, uh, then we've got complete disorder. Just like when Adam, when Adam's, Adam fell in, in the fall, Adam fell in his reason first, and only then did the rest of the man disobey his reason. The reason disobeyed God, and then the rest of the man, the passions, disobeyed the reason. And if, and it, therefore, it follows, if you've got a son whose passions are all over the place, get, work on his reason, get men, preferably men, to work on his reason, so that his reason will read, <laughs> find its way back to God, and then the passions will begin to find their way back to reason. It stands to it stands to reason. <laughs> it's a huge discourse. It's a discourse which the modern world has got completely wrong. It's getting it wronger and wronger all the time. It's more and more proud of this stupid false equality, because what it's trying to do is trying to force <laughs> the women to be creatures of reason, which they aren't. They can reason. A girl can. Go to university and she, or to school, to high school, and she can oft, she often studies better than the boys. She learns it all by heart. She, she drinks it in, especially if the professor is good looking. She drinks it all in, but she's not thinking about what she's drinking. In. She just absorbs it in order to regurgitate it in the exam to please the professor. Again, that's the woman's instincts at work. There's nothing wrong with those instincts. But modern, modern life makes a monkey of those instincts. But she's not, she's not, she's rarely properly thinking about what she's learned. She's better at learning, but she, she doesn't, she's not thinking about it. And the boys, never, in any school, in any school, never let the girls compete with the boys when it comes to marks and studies. Because once the boys are defeated, by girls who learned the tele learned the, done the studies better, like in the manner of learning a telephone a telephone book. Once the girl gets a better mark, the boy is immediately going to stop working. He is not going to be uh, bested by a woman. That's natural male pride. I say it's natural. Of course, pride can be sinful. But in the case, in this case, of relations between man and woman. It's not natural for any man to be bested by a woman. And a wise woman will never best a man. A wise woman will never best a man. Anything you can do, I can do better. Stupid song. 1940s, 1950s, Annie Get Your Gun. Anybody know that one? I know these ancient songs. Anything you can, anything you can do, I can do better. I can do better, anything better than you. <laughs> Stupid woman. Female dog. That's a word that begins with B and ends in H. Men run, I've said they run on reason, they also run on ego. We men run on ego. Women run on love. Which is why the one thing that a wife needs next after the mercy of God is her husband's love. And that's not silly, soppy sentimentality. It's not slush. It's a genuine care for her well-being. That's what a wife needs. And give her a teaspoonful of affection, and she's good for another 200 miles. <laughs> True. Yes. They need love. They run on love. Men don't run on love. Men run on ego. That's why in Scripture, <coughs> Word of God, and I'm not pulling all of this out of a, a conjurer's hat or a marches. I don't know. No. <coughs> Husbands, love, cherish your wives, love your wives, says St. Paul, and, and do not be and do not be harsh towards them. <coughs> a man can be very cruel to his wife by by being the opposite of loving with her. He hurts her. And she'll come back ten years later with him. She'll never forget him. And she will, if she's naughty, she will use it. Use it down the years. You! And he's forgot, completely forgotten. She'll come out with him. He's forgotten. 
Men, men run on ego, and therefore St. Paul says, wives, obey your husbands. That hurts. The old marriage vow was always to, what's it, to I will suddenly keep and obey, and of course the obey now gets left out. Love, honor, and obey, thank you. Whereas now, it's, uh, the, the man promises to love and honor his wife, and she promises to love, honor, and obey her husband. It's in scripture. Wives, obey your husbands. It's common sense. But, if you, wives, if you want to be loved, be lovable. <laughs> if you want to be loved, be lovable. Men, if you want to be respected, be deserving of respect and don't be a dish rag. How can a woman honor a dish rag? And if you don't want to be a dish rag, turn yourself towards God. Turn your reason towards God towards our Lord Jesus Christ, towards His Church, towards our duty to God, the Ten Commandments, starting with the First Commandment. I shall honor, uh, uh, honor, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind. If a man puts the First Commandment at the top of his life, and the top of his head, the whole marriage will start straightening out. St. Paul says, in, in the First Epistle of the Romans, in the first, the, the, a large part of the second half of the first chapter of the first of the Epistle of the Romans deals with <coughs> homosexuality. And St. Paul says three times that homosexuality follows upon idolatry. In other words, you break the first commandment, you will break the sixth commandment. Breaking the sixth commandment follows on breaking the first commandment. Then, again, if you want to get your sons or children out of problems with the Sixth Commandment, get them back to the First Commandment. Put the First Commandment back in, in this right place in their lives. And how will you do that? Much the best way to get the First Commandment back in the place should be in the lives of your children, example. Especially Dad's example. Many a vocation you can, I've observed, it comes from a family where the, the father takes his religion seriously. That's where the vocations come. It's not enough for the mother to take a religion seriously, although that can do it. It's when the father gives the example, which is the example he is the head of the house should be giving. It shouldn't be the woman that has to lead the religion in the home. How many men say, oh, religion is for the women and children? No way, no way, no way. They'll be terribly punished in their families. But if the men put, put themselves underneath our Lord Jesus Christ, underneath God, then the woman will find it much easier to put herself underneath the man, where she belongs. Not in the sense of the man tyrannizing over his wife or crushing her or giving her stupid orders and commands, not at all. In the sense of the man exercising the headship in the way it should be exercised for, for the good of the whole family, for the good of the husband and for the good of the wife. I wasn't going to talk about this, but there's a gracious lady sitting up front who came to the end of the uh, uh, bowling alley and took a big bowl and rolled it like that and the skittles flew. It's a big question and a very important question today. It's, it's a secondary question, strictly it's a secondary question. The primary question is men and their religion, men and their God. And a wise woman will wrap herself around her husband and guide, help from the back seat will guide him towards God. She will do what she best, as best she can, can to help and encourage and lift her husband towards God. But she mustn't lead, and she mustn't try to lead. And she must avoid, if she possibly can, even the appearance of leading. Avoid anything that can humiliate her husband, if she's wise, even if he doesn't love her. But she, deserves, she does that, she deserves to be loved. So, wives be lovable, because you need the love, Husbands, be deserving of respect because that is what will make the marriage work. If your wife respects you and if you love your wife, that is what will make the marriage work. Enough said for the moment.
Uh, if we go upstairs across the road. I was waiting, I was waiting for the applause. Is it Back to the very, very original question. Oh, right, upstairs, upstairs, right. 